So my name is Aisha Mirza. I'm a writer and an artist and a social worker working in mental health. Um, and I make things about mental health and queerness and brownness um, and body hair and microaggressions and whatever else I feel like. Um, I often describe like my self-care practice as like shutting down conversations I don't want to be part of or like saying no like very assertively and like very frequently or like leaving spaces as soon as I feel uncomfortable um, I think growing up I like felt <clears throat> uncomfortable a lot and would like understand that as like a problem with me but it's been very useful to realize of course I feel uncomfortable often in this world you know um, and it's okay for me to like physically remove my body from those spaces and find other ones and not do the work of like trying to adapt <laughs> um, and all of those things to me is like you know what self-care looks like well I had been watching Hanum like everyone else like but for a really long time I was so intrigued by her and amazed and also really interested as I would like read all the different stories that were coming out about her and it was this same kind of narrative of like this Sikh woman isn't allowed to cut her hair and now she has a beard and she's really strong and powerful and doesn't care what anyone says about that you know and she is really strong and she is really powerful but I was interested in like the the rest of it you know because like if if I struggle to go outside with hairy legs and I feel like a psychic toll when I do. I wanted to know what her experience was like too. I'm always interested in like mental health and how people are holding and where they're holding the grief of like being considered disgusting. White bodies are again the model that we're using to talk about body hair and, and the oppression associated with it. I know a lot of white people who are hairier than me or like who have pale skin and really dark hair which like in a lot of ways is a different struggle to mine um, and I don't want to dismiss that completely I think what the difference is that the, is that those white bodies aren't carrying those legacies of trauma and like haven't had brownness or darkness or hairiness associated with that very specific like racism um, that the rest of us have. They haven't had to be respectable in the ways that we have and like therefore the weight for us when we experiment with our bodies in this way or just like try to like live the way that we want to, it's, it's not the same and I think that's the bit that really gets lost, you know? The moment I realised I was onto something with the body hair thing after like writing about it like slightly ashamedly for a while because everyone's like this is ridiculous, you know, this is so trivial, like people are dying, like all of that, um, was like when I did start to grow my own body hair out and my mum had like a really strong reaction to it and I knew that there's, there was something in the way that she was looking at me, there was something in her reaction that was so violent that was about the racism that she grew up around and like the respectability and like her fear for me in the world as a brown body trying to like succeed or like assimilate when that's appropriate, kind of carrying these markers of like what we have internalized as dirt. I dated someone for a while and they lived like 10 minutes away and every time I went to see them I brought them roses which was too much. Turns out don't do that. <laughs> like I wasn't you know out as a queer person when I was in London and I like stepped off the plane in New York and like was very queer you know immediately and that wasn't even a choice that I consciously made it was just like clearly that space allowed me to do that um, and it's also brought me to a place where there is so much more discourse around being South Asian and being queer and being political and what diaspora means and art and things that are still kind of bubbling in London like coming out is like this made-up thing and I don't think people should feel like they have to do it you know and I'm very glad that I didn't for a long time um, but at this point I'm pretty like forthright about who I am and what I'm interested in and what I'm going to do and I have a kind of like take it or leave it approach to to everyone 
and it's worked pretty well like the people that take it take it the BuzzFeed article was inspired by my time spent being close to white people broadly speaking and the like really intense process of like decolonization that I've gone through over the last four or five years and the fact that that has involved um, saying goodbye to a lot of people, a lot of white people who at other points in my life have been you know very dear to me. The response was amazing um, and like kind of life-changing for me like it just resonated with a lot of people um, and a lot of people most of the responses were people saying um, you've kind of provided me with language for a thing that I've experienced for a long time that I didn't even know was happening which is the thing about microaggressions and it's like why I tried to center that piece so much about looks because they can so easily be dismissed you know like your feelings about a look um, because it's the kind of violence that's just so quiet. Uh, yeah, so there was like a lot of affirmation um, and joy in the reception of the article and also like a good amount of kind of really violent hate mail or whatever. But that was, that was cool because I realized that I was at a point where, as far as I can tell, it doesn't really bother me anymore. And I have been, I've been writing for a long time and I've always had, you know, violent responses, of course, as like a queer person of colour. I'm a huge advocate of therapy. Um, and I feel like a bit of an asshole whenever I say that because obviously there are so many barriers to, to getting therapy for so many people. But I think if you can do it, um, it's not an easy process. Just because someone calls themselves a therapist doesn't mean it's going to work for you, doesn't mean they're the right person for you or you're the right person for them. Like, you want to be with someone who, like, excites you and challenges you and who you feel is, like, way smarter than you are, you know, which isn't always going to happen. So, like, know that. Go in with a bit of an ego if you can and, like, really, like, trust your gut. It's a process, you know, and I think there's not that much education around that process and I wish there was more. The way race is organised in London is pretty troubling because there's this idea that like diversity and multiculturalism, whatever that means, is inherently progressive. There's this really strong propaganda about the fact that once you're in London, you're a Londoner and it doesn't matter where you come from. And like, we know that's not true. It's, it's also like this huge gaslighting experience where we're told constantly that everything is okay now because we live in a multicultural city and so when we continue to feel anxious and uncomfortable the whole time because whiteness is still the steel rod at the core of that city we think we must be the problem and so for me to explore my like growing discomfort and like heal from the mental health crisis I had been through I had to get out and go to this other fucked up place that I feel is much more honest about how fucked up it is. Um, you know, I had to go to a place where I could be completely surrounded by black and brown bodies in my neighborhood and in my community and kind of go from there. This mental and physical repositioning of my South Asian and North African body allowed it like to not just be this reaction to whiteness, but also to really compassionately ask questions about my suffering and the suffering of my people and also our privileges. You know, one of my favorite things about engaging extensively in queer, black and POC community has been spending time with other queer South Asian artists, but that experience also has this sadness to it, this Asian sadness. I feel like when we get together, there's often this heaviness to the experience, like this collective weight and awkwardness that's really intriguing and beautiful and makes me feel like weirdly close to my diaspora even though I'm like technically two or three times removed from it. But I think it's really important to dig into these feelings of sadness because they hold so much. Like they hold the legacies of our trauma. And I also think unexplored, like these sadnesses can become really harmful, you know? Like for example, perpetuating anti-blackness because we can become so wrapped up in our own sorrow as South Asian people that we forget to be critical about how we also benefit from our Asian-ness. 
like our light skin if we have it our proximity to whiteness in my case like racial ambiguity the ways in which historically we've benefited from black labor and art and continue to the ways that anti-blackness are hardwired into our own communities and what our responsibilities are to tackle that yeah i think one of my favorite things about queer south asian spaces has been the opportunity to delve into this nuance as an oppressed and oppressive people to like increase active compassion for myself and for the people i'm trying to share community with 